Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I am Dr. Rajneesh Kumar Singh from Faculty of Law, Banaras Hindu University and I have come here with your course on ADR and arbitration. Uh, in today's session, we will talk about meaning and importance of ADR but before that, let me tell you something about the course which I propose to present to you. Uh, this course is divided into 20 sessions. We will start with basic understanding of ADR followed by focusing more on arbitration. As you are aware, nowadays with increasing emphasis on trade and business, the trading community does not want to get into litigation because it is commonly known to everyone that litigation is a time-taking process. As it is said that suits lag and appeals drag for years together in Indian courts. Therefore, ADR has emerged as a viable option to the existing justice delivery system, which is actually the existing court system. So far, whatever you must have uh, studied in law, all those subjects revolve around the court system. So you are familiar with a system called as adversarial system, where parties are adversaries to each other. Now, what I will do in next 20 sessions is, I will bring a proposal, I will suggest a mechanism where parties will not be pitted against each other. I will present a spectrum of various methods of dispute resolution. On one extreme we will have litigation, on other extreme we have a very flexible method called as negotiation and in the entire spectrum we will see which method suits what kind of dispute resolution. So, we will start with the first session that is on meaning and importance of ADR and before anything, let us understand what is the meaning of the term dispute. As we all understand, disputes are inevitable results of differences. Differences in terms of personality differences, cultural differences on the basis of backgrounds to which we belong. There will be differences of opinion and, and thoughts to which we subscribe to. All these differences may lead up to disputes. When does a dispute arise? A dispute arise when parties take definite stand on certain issues. For example, if I tell you that there is an object and I ask you to, to tell me the price of this object and one of you will say that it is of rupees 5 and the other person says that it is of rupees 10, you have definite stands on the possible price of that object. But if both of you are, are, are of the opinion that probably the price may be from 5 to 10, then there is no definite stand which you hold on this subject. In such a situation, in order to avoid a dispute, you may approach an expert and ask the right price. So that is a situation of avoiding the dispute. But when you hold definite stands, it is a situation of LIS, L-I-S, which means dispute, which means conflict. Conflicts are a natural part of anybody's life. Conflict emerges when disagreements, differences, annoyances, competition or inequities threaten something really important for you. So, if because of disagreements, if because of differences, your interests are getting affected, your rights are getting affected, that is a state of hostility, that is a state of conflict, that state may be called as dispute. Conflict is a collision of viewpoints. Conflict is a collision of opinions between individuals. It can be between groups. It can be between corporations. Now, one way to look at the conflict is that when you look at the conflict, you will understand that things which are put on table are not everything which are part of that conflict. 
there are many things for example your desires your self esteem your emotions your hidden expectations these are hidden aspects of any dispute and these are never presented to the other party there may be scars of unresolved past issues and these aspects do not come to fore in any court based system in a litigation you only talk in terms of rights you only talk in terms of claims and these agendas remain hidden agenda in litigation whereas on the other hand the interest based process to resolve disputes primarily focuses on these aspects the emotions the interests the hidden expectations the real motive and interest will surface in any participative process or in an adr process see the most important characteristic of any conflict is that claim of a party is considered as not acceptable to the other party so i am not going to accept your claims you are not going to accept my claims but there may be interests behind these claims which may be partly acceptable so what i am trying to say is if we only talk in terms of claims we may never come to a settlement a resolution a solution but when we start talking in terms of interests which are behind these claims which may be partly acceptable to the other party there are chances that we we may arrive at a solution so this is what i mean by the term dispute it is a state of hostility it is a state of conflict it emerges because parties take definite stands which are entirely different from one another and it happens when your interests are harmed by maybe disagreements differences annoyances now coming to the term adr adr means alternative dispute resolution adr is an alternative to existing justice delivery system the existing justice delivery system is in the form of court system which we see there are two main types of dispute resolution mechanism one is a binding process which results in a decision by a third party and this includes courts and tribunals established by statutes so the first system of dispute resolution as i said is a binding process the decisions of courts are binding the decisions of tribunals are bindings tribunals have been invented have been created to reduce the burden of existing courts you must have studied about tribunals in other subjects also you must have studied about tribunals in administrative law where we talk about central administrative tribunal which has been established to 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 prevent the courts from the avalanche of service matters and writ petitions and the tribunal is working very efficiently i can tell you that but the fact remains that whether it is a regular court or a tribunal the process by and large remains the same the extent of technicalities to some extent are less in case of tribunals because tribunals work more according to principles of natural justice whereas the technicalities involved in court system are extremely high both these bodies pass binding decisions where a neutral third party judge in a in in case of court and and the presiding officer of the tribunal they are neutral third parties and have limited role in the whole process this is one dispute resolution method which we call as adversarial method where there are two parties and a presiding judge the rules are already framed there is no flexibility involved the procedure is already framed in the form of maybe code of civil procedure the evidence act is already framed the set mechanism is going to be used the decision shall be binding unless it is changed in 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 appeal or review or revision this is one method of dispute resolution which is adversarial the second method is a non binding method 
which is based on consent of the parties and which does not lead to any binding decision, which does not lead to establishment of guilt, but which leads to settlement. This non-binding process, which is based on the consent of the parties, take parties to a settlement. Now, therefore, there are two methods. One is binding, one is non-binding. One is extremely formal, one is informal. One takes you to a binding decision, the other takes you to settlement. One takes you to something called as decree, the other takes you to resolution. Now, in between these two processes, I will fit one method which we call as arbitration. Why do I want to keep arbitration between court system and the non-binding system is? Because arbitration has features of both the systems. In an arbitral process, the end product is also a binding award. So it is similar to litigation. Arbitration has the nature of adversarial process, so therefore it is similar to litigation. But at the same time, arbitration is consent based process. It does not take you to settlement, but it is based on consent of the parties. Parties voluntarily by entering into an agreement, agree to refer their disputes for arbitration. So it has got features of both the participative process ADR as well as the adversarial process litigation. So therefore, between these two extremes, I prefer to keep the process called as arbitration. In addition to these basic processes, one is litigation, which is adversarial. The other is ADR, which is participative. In between these two, we have one more process called as inquisitorial process or inquisitorial method. Inquisitorial method is more prevalent in civil law countries, Germany, Austria, France. In inquisitorial method, all the three parties, the two parties and the judge, the presiding officer, all three work in one direction to find out the truth. So therefore, in adversarial process, the ultimate aim is to establish guilt of a party. In participative system, the ultimate aim is to take parties to settlement. In inquisitorial system, the ultimate aim is to discover truth. For example, in Indian context, you have an act called as Commissions of Inquiry Act 1952, under which commissions are appointed to inquire into a definite matter of public importance. You must have heard about it. For example, if there is a rail accident, then Parliament may, may establish a commission, appoint a commission to inquire into that matter because it happens to be a matter of definite public importance. Now, under the Commission of Inquiry Act, the commission which is appointed does not work according to adversarial system. It works according to inquisitorial system, where everybody who is called before the commission is a witness. And with the help of examining all the witnesses, ultimately, truth has to be discovered. Inquisitorial system does not take us to establishment of guilt. Inquisitorial system does not take us to settlement. It takes us to recommendations. Right? So broadly, there are three methods of dispute resolution. One is adversarial, the other is inquisitorial, and the third one is participative. Inquisitorial is not that used in Indian context except the act which I mentioned. So we will be mostly talking about adversarial and participative system. Adversarial system, as I said, is the existing court system or where a tribunal is resolving the matter and participative system is ADR. So therefore, how can we define ADR? ADR is alternative to existing dispute resolution method. It is any dispute resolution method which is based on consent of the parties and which takes parties to settlement. So ADR is any consent based dispute resolution method which takes parties to settlement. There are some basic processes, there are some hybrid processes, for example, basic processes such as mediation, conciliation, lok adalat, these are basic processes of ADR. 
and all these are important. For example, mediation is guided negotiation. When parties are encouraged to talk in the presence of a third party who will guide the negotiation process. And this third party by way of his diplomacy will ensure that parties gradually narrow down their disputes and reach to a settlement. That method is mediation. Now, imagine a dispute between family members in which preserving relationship is very important. There is a dispute between husband and wife where preserving relationship is very important. If you take this dispute to litigation, litigation will not restructure the relationship, it will rupture the relationship. You will hardly find people coming out of litigation saying that we have become friends after litigation. But you will invariably find people who become friends and come close after mediation. And therefore, you must have heard that these high courts have mediation centers for disputes related to family matters so that relationships are not ruptured. Mediation is not just useful only in family matters. It is equally useful in commercial matters nowadays. Recently, you must have heard that in one of the houses of parliament has passed the mediation bill. So very soon, we are going to get an act, a law, which provides for the detailed mechanism of mediation of commercial disputes, where traders start using or businessmen start using mediation as a mode of dispute resolution. The second word which I have used, you see, is conciliation. This is also one of the modes of dispute resolution. The difference between mediation and conciliation is only that conciliation is a bit more formal. It has been explained in the statute. Part 3 of Arbitration Conciliation Act provides details about the mechanism of conciliation. Otherwise, the method by and large is same where there are two disputing parties and a conciliator, a third party is appointed so as to ensure that disputing parties reach to an amicable settlement. We will talk more about these terms later on. So what I want to tell you is that ADR is any consent based process. You yourself can devise a method of ADR provided these two ingredients are taken into account. The method whatever you design must be consent based and it must take parties to settlement. This is different from adversarial method. We will talk about the differences in later slides. Now, as I said, I will give you the spectrum of various methods of dispute resolution. On one extreme, you have litigation. On the other extreme, you have negotiation. So from litigation, you have arbitration. Then there are two words, mediation and conciliation. Then you have negotiation. As you move from litigation towards negotiation, party autonomy increases. What do you mean by that? Party autonomy means whatever is the extent of involvement of parties in the dispute resolution process. What is the extent of choices which parties have been allowed to make? For example, if I, if I, uh, Take the example of litigation. Rules are already framed. You cannot say that my dispute will not be resolved according to this law. My dispute will be resolved according to this procedure. You cannot. If you go to a civil court, you have to file a suit. Then there will be a written statement. The, the processes are fixed. There is no choice you can make. You don't have freedom. But as you go to arbitration, there is tremendous autonomy given to parties. Parties will decide when to commence the proceeding. Parties will decide the place of arbitration. Parties have to decide the language of arbitration. Parties will have a number of choices to make. Which procedural rule will apply? They can say that we don't want to apply code of civil procedure. They may say that we don't want to apply Indian Evidence Act. So parties have autonomy in the sense that they can decide what shall be the procedural law for their dispute resolution. Parties will decide whether they want to do their arbitration according to oral hearings or do they want to do it by documents only. They have to decide whether the tribunal, arbitral tribunal will decide according to majority rule or some other rule will be invented. 
So that is the extent of freedom given to the parties in arbitration. And I am saying that as you go from litigation towards negotiation, the autonomy is, is increasing. In mediation, you don't have any set of binding rules for you. You decide the modalities of mediation. You decide who shall be the mediator. In conciliation, the method of conciliation is very flexible. The role of conciliator is to remain objective. The role of conciliator is to remain unbiased. The role of conciliator is to maintain confidentiality of the proceeding. The role of conciliator is to assist parties to reach to settlement. Conciliator will not propose settlements. The settlement which ultimately is the result of mediation or conciliation is to be drawn by the parties themselves. Parties have to finally draw up the settlement or if they request in that case only the conciliator or the mediator can help them in, help them in drawing up the settlement. So that is the extent of autonomy which has been given to the parties. And the last process which I have mentioned, negotiation, you have extreme autonomy because negotiation is a process where parties sit across a table and start a talk. There is no third party involved. You have to understand that if you want to gain something, you will have to at the same time give away something. So if both the parties agree on this idea that you earn something by giving out something, there lies the success of negotiation. It is all controlled by parties. It is all managed by parties. So I said as you move from litigation to negotiation, party autonomy increases. Parties control over the proceeding increases. As I said, it is one of the dimensions of party autonomy itself. You decide which rule to be applied. You refer to an institution that my arbitration shall be done by ICC, International Chamber of Commerce. You decide the body which will do arbitration for you. You don't have to go to the, the, the court which has been identified for that dispute. You must be familiar. Depending on the subject matter, jurisdiction of a court is prefixed. If a matter is of this value, it will go to X court. If the matter is of this value, it will go to Y court. You don't have the freedom to decide which court is to be asked to resolve the dispute. If the matter is a commercial matter, it will go to commercial court, according to Commercial Courts Act 2015. So therefore, parties do not control over the proceedings. It is all controlled by advocates. Litigation is all controlled by advocates. The first two, litigation and arbitration are adversarial. The last two, mediation, conciliation and negotiation, these are participative process. As I said, arbitration is a kind of hybrid because it has aspects of both adversarial as well as participative process. As I mentioned, alternative dispute resolution techniques include some basic processes like arbitration, conciliation, mediation and negotiation. And there are certain hybrid processes. I will talk about these hybrid processes later on. These are mini trial, medar, concilio arbitration, uh, early neutral evaluation. I will talk about these uh, hybrid processes maybe a bit later on. The dispute resolution by courts, as I have been saying, is adversarial in nature. The decision is binding and the decision is to be accepted even if it is not liked by the parties. There are a few words you must be familiar, delay, uncertainty, rigidity, cost, unfriendly environment in the court. These have become hallmark of adversarial process in India. Before we talk more about ADR or before we talk about arbitration specifically, because as I said, that I will give you some basic idea of ADR and then mainly I'll be focusing on arbitration. Let's talk a bit about existing justice delivery system, which is the court system. There are some problems in court system that probably led to creation of tribunals at one point of time. And those problems have not been cured so far. So therefore, that provides a justification to go for alternative methods. What are these problems? I have highlighted some of these. 
First is the volume of litigation has increased many folds. You must be aware that courts, dockets are full. There are crores and crores of cases pending in various courts, including the highest court, Supreme Court of India. Why do we have this pendency? I have identified few reasons. The first reason is large number of enactments. India is a country of hundreds of legislations. You must have heard recently government has started scrapping certain obsolete laws. From 2017 onwards, government has started doing away with some tribunals which are not required or merging few tribunals. All this will lead, lead to simplifying the complexities which are involved in existing system. So first reason is large number of enactments. The second is procedural complexities. Follow the procedure of CPC and you will realize the complexities inherent. Why do we have complexities in CPC? We need to understand it also. If we understand that CPC is complex, why don't we change it? We don't change it because actually we cannot change it. Because there are certain principles, for example, an innocent must not be punished. In, a, in criminal law, if you want to say that innocent must not be punished, then therefore we must examine every evidence in best possible manner and therefore procedures have to be followed. In a civil case, suppose you want to say that the matter must be or issue must be determined beyond doubt, then in that case you will have to follow the procedure. So complexities are part of the mechanism. We cannot remove these complexities altogether. We made an attempt by amending CPC, but all those amendments are not yielding results which we expected from the amendments. For example, the amendment, the law may say that no more than three adjournments shall be given. But what if a fourth adjournment is claimed? Law will say the court will impose heavy cost in case fourth adjournment is granted. But if the poor litigant does not have paying capacity, how will you recover the cost? So there are technicalities, there are difficulties, there are complexities which are part of the system and we have to work with that complexities. In addition to that, there are number of possibilities of appeals and reviews and revisions. The matter remains alive for years. The third point which I have mentioned here is the poor judge population ratio in India. In 1990s, Justice Shetty Commission was appointed to propose mechanisms to enhance efficiency of justice administration. And one of the observations of Justice Shetty Commission was that in India, the judge population ratio is very adverse. At that point of time, the report said that India has 10 judges per million population. For 10 lakh population, you have just 10 judges. That was the stage then. The 2020 data says that Today, we have approximately 21 judges per million population. That's a good increase. But we are still short of international standards, maybe American standards. In America, it is more than 50 judges per million population. It is more than 50 judges per million population. So see the contrast. In a country of 150 crores, it is 21 judges per million population. Now, add this with to some other information which I am giving you. First, in USA, majority of cases do not get trial at court. Not because they are people who believe in settling the matters. It is because uh, litigation is a very costly thing in USA. So, large number of cases, approximately 85-90% cases are settled outside the court. In India, you really have very low percentage of cases getting settled outside the court. So you imagine in a country where 90% cases do not go to court, they have 50 judges per million population. In a country where 100% cases have to go to court, there is a syndrome called as jackpot syndrome. Whenever a litigant starts exploring possibility with respect to his case, the first thought which comes to his mind is that he is going to win the case in next four hearings or next five hearings. This is a general tendency which does not happen because then it will go there, it will be on for, for, for decades. 
So there are problems. One is volume of litigation. The region identified is large number of enactments. There are procedural complexities. And the very important region is the adverse, the poor judge population ratio. Now government is working on that. It's very simple to understand. When we decide how many administrators are required, we take population, the demography as the unit. In order to regulate this much of population, we need these many administrators. But when we have to decide how many judges are required, we don't take demography as the unit. That's the problem. And when there is delay in disposal of cases, that will lead to erosion of faith of people in justice delivery system. We will not believe in the justice delivery system. As of now, that state has not come in a country like India because people by and large have faith in, in court system in India. But if delays continue, we will lose faith in our system. It frustrates the basic purpose for which we have the justice delivery system. That is to bring peace in the society. You see, there are few things which you must be aware of. The language of court is not comprehensible by common people. Common people don't understand the language of court. The outcome of case is not at all predictable. Large part of the court proceeding is conducted in a manner which is absolutely strange to the disputing parties. We are absolutely unaware of the method. It is all dictated and controlled by advocates. And as the case progresses in court of law, parties start feeling helplessness. Parties start feeling powerlessness because they start losing control over what is happening in the court. This feeling of helplessness is very common in litigation. What Indian courts do, or for that matter, what any court does, it provides remedies. But the basis to provide remedy is, the remedy must be commensurate to the guilt. A remedy has no connection with the need of the victim or need of the opposite party. It only depends on the guilt of one party. In litigation, the decisions are never tailor-made. It is a kind of one fit for all. In a similar situation, this happened 10 years back, the same will happen now. So the victim has no space in existing justice delivery system. The other party has no space in existing justice delivery system. This aspect of the system creates frustration in disputants. In addition to this, the high cost involved in litigation. I am saying high cost is involved in litigation. You don't just have to pay the court fees and, and the advocates fee for, for one month or two months. Because of the delay, the expenses increase. And therefore, it becomes a highly costly process. The procedural complexities, all these frustrate the litigants. The hostile environment during the court proceedings, where parties are pitted against each other, parties are adversaries. This has the potential to rupture your relationship. Thus, if restructuring relationship is a consideration, an alternative to court system has to be evolved. Therefore, what I wanted to conclude out of all these discussion on existing justice delivery system is that aspects of delay, expense, uncertainty of possible relief, complexity of process, extreme helplessness of parties, all these are part of adversarial process and these give me justification to talk about or promote a system which is based on consent of the parties and which take parties to settlement. These problems are even more serious for poor litigants or downtrodden people. Because you see, majority of litigants in India are not sophisticated litigants. We don't understand our rights. Forget about understanding the procedure to be followed by court. So this is a, a kind of conclusion where we are comparing the two methods the adversarial method, the court method, and the second is the participative approach. You see, in the first, positions are placed on the table, issues and claims are placed on the table. 
that means the real problem remain under the table the interest of the parties are unstated and therefore only one party can win the other has to lose so adversarial process is win lose situation adversarial process is where interests are not presented claims are presented against that in participative approach interests of parties are stated and interests are the focus problems are placed on the table positions your definite stands become less important and therefore when parties reach to a settlement it is not a case where one party is winning the other is losing it is a case which can be said as a win win situation now let's come to some of the features of adr it is voluntary and it is empowering why i am saying that it is voluntary because if there is a property dispute between a and b they don't have to come together to decide which court to approach they will have to a designated court which will entertain the matter and it has to necessarily go there to the contrary in case where you and me have a business relationship we enter into an agreement that in case any dispute will arise out of this business relationship we will refer our dispute to either arbitration or maybe conciliation or mediation we are voluntarily deciding to take it to a particular mode of dispute resolution it's a voluntary process it is empowering as i have been saying that you don't feel helplessness you have full autonomy to decide a number of things in adr what shall be the place what shall be the language who shall be the arbitrator which law to be applied which procedure to be followed whether hearing will be given or not whether it will be document only proceeding lot of autonomy that leads to empowerment second point is it is party centered it is all controlled managed governed by parties third the process is cordial the process is flexible it is for the parties to decide whether they will be bound by cpc code of civil procedure they'll be bound by evidence act they may invent their own procedure which they want to follow most important thing as i've been saying parties are not pitted against each other they are not foes they come out as friends in fact parties contributing in finding out the best solution it is not something which is imposed by the judge it emerges out of their discussion discussion of the parties the next feature is it is an efficacious process it is efficacious process because it is speedy it doesn't consume a lot of time you have to decide what shall be the timeline for example if you are in a process of arbitration arbitration conciliation act section 29a fixes a timeline of 12 months unless the time is extended by the parties or by the court the timeline fixed for one arbitration is 12 months and if you opt for fast track arbitration the timeline is just 6 months so imagine how fast is the process it is efficient in the sense that all the presiding officers themselves most of the times are experts because parties will decide what shall be the qualification of the presiding officer what shall be the qualification of the mediator what shall be the qualification of arbitrator so therefore by the fact that they are qualified people technically qualified people on that subject we can assume that they will give a an efficient outcome second it is a convenient process because you decide the time you decide the place you decide the modalities it may be mentioned here that settlement whether pre trial court induced or a settlement in a voluntary mediation there are three words which i have mentioned you can see pre trial settlement court induced settlement voluntary settlement before trial commences court for example in 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 commercial courts act there is a provision which says that pre trial mediation is mandatory proposal or offer to go for pre trial mediation is mandatory so every court every commercial court is obliged to request parties to opt for mediation 
that is pre trial mediation pre trial settlement the second stage we will talk about some provision of cpc in which it is mentioned that during trial if the presiding officer is of the view that there exists element of settlement between the parties the presiding officer may refer the parties for settlement this is court induced adr court induced settlement and the third kind of settlement is voluntary settlement when parties willingly go for settlement so in all these three situations whether it is pre trial settlement or whether it is court induced settlement or whether it is voluntary settlement there is one very significant advantage that whatever done said in these processes will not prejudice the right of the parties to raise the matter again in any other litigation or arbitration so a failed mediation or a failed negotiation does not mean that the issues which you you have already raised in in, in mediation cannot be raised again in litigation so that is a significant advantage that makes it an efficacious process that attracts disputants towards these methods this is cost effective by the fact that it is going to be 3 months 6 months 12 months that itself makes it cost effective i won't say arbitration is very cost effective because businesses spend lot of money in arbitration they get uh, counsels who are highly paid arbitrators fees is also to be paid so i won't say arbitration is a very cost effective method but mediation conciliation negotiation these are very cost effective method even in case of arbitration there is a mechanism of fixing the uh, fees of arbitrators you have schedule 4 we may refer to that schedule later on it is less time consuming as we all know justice delayed is justice denied so therefore that problem is not likely to arise in case of adr the problem of tremendous pendency of cases backlog of cases has has immensely tarnished the image of existing system delay is happening because of multiple regions i mention few regions there is tremendous workload in subordinate judiciaries every single judge has to entertain hundreds of cases every day imagine what kind of tailor made decisions will come imagine what kind of judgments will be del delivered on the other hand alternate dispute resolution mechanism can be structured can be time bound in addition to these you have few more features confidentiality is one important aspect of adr and in fact the feature of confidentiality generates lot of trust and faith in the process and the parties in adr get encouraged to share all the issues and information if you get a chance to observe a mediation process you will see that mediation through his diplomacy is helping parties to talk to each other talk with each other not talk at each other and in the process they are disclosing things which otherwise would remain confidential in court system because both these parties have the assurance of the mediator that all these discussions will remain confidential and at times when mediation is not likely to succeed there may be impasse nothing is moving ahead in that situation mediation will use the method of caucus where mediator mediator will talk to the parties individually and that is the stage where parties disclose informations which they would otherwise never disclose in litigation in court now disclosure of these confidential information tremendously help the mediator to take parties to settlement in family matters that really is very useful in businesses also if the parties are assured of confidentiality they will prefer to disclose their trade secrets also i'll give you the case where central information commission in the case of rama agarwal versus public information officer 
Delhi State Legal Service Authority. The CIC held that proceedings during mediation are protected under the exceptions in the Right to Information Act. So you cannot claim the, the proceedings of mediation as a matter of right under Right to Information Act. These are covered under the exceptions in Section 8. And CIC held that these information are not subject to be disclosed as no public interest is served on disclosure and there exists larger public interest protecting the information. This confidentiality that it will remain confidential, this will not be part of part of uh, information which may be disclosed under RTI, it gets the privilege of exception of section 8. This ensures the parties that they may freely disclose even their trade secrets which otherwise will never be disclosed in court, in litigation. A very significant difference between ADR and litigation is privacy. Courts are done in open courts. Suits are, are, are pursued in open courts where ADR processes are never open. These remain within the confines of two parties and the neutral third party who may be mediator or conciliator or arbitrator. So these are some of the features as I said. The process is voluntary, it is empowering, ADR is party centered, ADR is very cordial and flexible, the processes are efficacious, whatever you say during these processes will not prejudice your right to raise these issues again during litigation or in subsequent arbitration. These are cost effective methods, less time consuming processes confidentiality, privacy of the proceeding, that is the most important feature. The next feature is solutions can be creative and flexible, but whatever solutions you arrive at must be within law. You cannot do a contract out of law, so therefore the settlement must not be unlawful. Presence of independent third party is really useful, many a times negotiations do not succeed and the third party by way of his abilities and diplomacy lead to settlement. The next is uh, there are various processes. I will discuss briefly some of these processes. As I said, ADR techniques include all methods by which resolution of dispute is done. But only two things are important. The method in question must be based on consent of the parties and it must take parties to settlement. Therefore, name of this course is ADR and arbitration. ADR and arbitration because arbitration does not take parties to settlement. So, it cannot be ADR. As I said, it is somewhere between ADR and litigation. Some of the methods which we commonly use in ADR, first is mediation. According to civil procedure, ADR and mediation rules 2003, Settlement by mediation means the process by which a mediator appointed by parties or by the court. So, there are two possibilities. Mediator can be appointed by the parties voluntary mediation. Mediator can be appointed by the court that is court induced mediation. During the trial court may decide that let us send parties for settlement. It happens. It happens under section 89 of CPC. We will talk about it maybe later. So, whether it is a case of mediator appointed by the parties or whether it is appointed by the court, the mediator mediates the dispute between the parties. How? By facilitating discussion between the parties directly or by communicating with each other through the mediator. So, mediator can facilitate talk between the parties or he can talk to the parties separately. And what he does, he tries to identify issues, he, he assists parties to identify issues, move away from claims, talk about issues. He tries to reduce misunderstandings between the parties. He clarifies their priorities. He explains areas of compromise. He helps in generating options in an attempt to solve the dispute. 
and emphasizing that it is the party's own responsibility for making decision which affect them. So I am not going to give you a decision. I am help you in exploring compromises. I will help you in clarifying your priorities. I will help you in identifying your issues. But it is your responsibility to come out with a settlement. That is mediation. Conciliation is quite similar to mediation except that it is slightly more formal. It is slightly more formal because it has been given statutory status. As I mentioned, Arbitration Conciliation Act Part 3 talks about conciliation. It clearly says who shall be the conciliator, what shall be the role of conciliator, what shall be the procedure which conciliator will follow, how conciliator will ultimately culminate into settlement, what shall be that settlement called, that settlement under Section 73 of Arbitration Conciliation Act is called as a settlement agreement. How will the proceedings of, of conciliation terminate? So all these details have been provided in part 3 of Arbitration Conciliation Act. Therefore, conciliation is more organized or more systematic maybe or more rigid you can say as compared to mediation which is entirely flexible. It is left for the parties with the help of mediator to decide every single thing in the process of mediation. So we understand the processes, one is mediation, the second is conciliation, third is negotiation which we do in our everyday life when we talk with our parents, maybe our associates, maybe our business connections, we keep negotiating. We always keep the best alternative to failed negotiation in our mind. Negotiation is a process which is nothing but one to one conversation. But keep in mind that a good negotiation is when you do not talk at each other. A good negotiation is when you talk to each other. It is a dialogue between two or more parties in an effort to resolve their differences and arrive at a mutually agreeable settlement. The very aim of the discussions between the parties is to solve the dispute or conflict. It may also be seen as a process in which each party gives up some portion of his claim to get the rest. A very simple example can be, I have five, I've got five oranges, you have, got, you have got ten apples. I like apples only. You like apples as well as oranges equally. I have got five oranges, you have got ten apples. I like apples only. So what I will propose, take my five oranges and return, why don't you give me five apples? Ultimately, you will have 10 pieces and you like all, both of these equally. And ultimately, I will get 5 pieces and I like those 5 pieces. So, we end up winning both. That is a good proposal. Now, this proposal is likely to go in positive direction and finally, parties will be in a win-win situation. But what if the other party says that, no, I am not willing to give you 5 apples in return of 5 oranges. I will prefer to give you two apples against five oranges. Now, there is a situation of a possible dispute. Now, this possibility or there is a situation that no settlement may be arrived at. If they keep on talking, what best can happen? The other party can agree to say, okay, fine, I'll give you three, three apples. In return, you will be giving me five oranges. You see, no settlement is likely. This is the stage when you require a neutral third party. This is the stage when you require a mediator who will help parties to move away from the impasse, to move away from the conflict and help parties to reach to a settlement. Maybe four apples against five oranges is still a good option as compared to two apples against five oranges. So you lose some to gain some. That is the idea of ADR. That is the idea of negotiation. Apart from these basic processes, there are certain hybrid processes, for example, MedArb starts with mediation and if mediation fails, the process converts into arbitration. So whatever information mediator must have acquired, he will be using that information when we, he becomes arbitrator. So as an arbitrator, whatever award he passes 
will have more acceptability because it has been passed by somebody who is aware of the details inside story of that case. A similar process can be concilio arbitration where it starts with conciliation. If conciliation fails, it converts into arbitration. In Indian context, we cannot have concilio arbitration possible because Indian law in part 3 says that a conciliator cannot subsequently become an arbitrator between the same parties. That is a different thing. We will talk about it later on. The third hybrid process is mini trial. This is arbitration then mediation. This is converse of medarb. Medarb is mediation followed by arbitration. Mini trial is converse of that. It starts with time bound non-binding arbitration. And if that time elapses, it converts into mediation. So what we have discussed here, we have identified the problems of existing justice delivery system. And therefore, I am saying that because of these regions, let us find out some alternative to existing justice delivery system. But that is not all. I am not promoting ADR just because there are problems in court system. I want to promote ADR because of some inherent merits in ADR. There are inherent merits, merits in ADR, there are inherent merits in arbitration. That is more stronger reason for me to promote ADR. Court system, the existing justice delivery system is also responding to the needs. For example, I said CPC, Code of Civil Procedure was amended few years back. Section 89 has become a reality. Section 89 is court induced ADR. It says that at any stage, at any point of time, if the presiding officer is of the view that there exists element of settlement between the parties, then that presiding officer shall formulate the terms of settlement and will refer these terms of settlement to the parties for their observation. The parties may give their observation, the presiding officer may or may not reformulate the terms of settlement and shall refer the parties for one of the modes of dispute resolution mentioned in section 89 itself. The modes mentioned are arbitration according to Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, conciliation again according to Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, mediation and judicial settlement through Lok Adalat. Initially, it was criticized that the language of provision section 89 appears to be quite harsh because there is no scope for taking consent of the parties before deciding whether to refer them to arbitration etc or not. Further, it does not require parties to give their consent for deciding which mode is good for them. But all these defects have been cured. There is no such issue. So I see section 89 as an attempt of existing justice delivery system to take parties to ADR even if they have come to the court. 89, you can say, is an opt-out provision where parties now can go out of, of, of court system and go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution. As I said, I promote ADR not just because there are problems in existing justice delivery system. I promote ADR because of inherent merits. So in this session, I am sure you have understood what is the meaning of dispute, what is the meaning of ADR, what are the problems in existing system, how ADR is going to, to, to cure those issues and why ADR is a good viable option to the existing justice delivery system. That is all I have for this session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.